Hey, Jan Osher here. I'm pleased to present Video Codex in 2020 and Beyond, a movie webinar. And here's our agenda. I want to start with some introductory realities, particularly the impact of the Alliance for Open Media and Hardware versus Software Codex, which to a great degree dictates the potential success of the codex we'll be discussing. Then we'll meet the codex, existing codecs like H.264, HEBC, VP9, and AB1, and the three codecs launched by Ampeg in the 2020-2021 timeframe, which were VBC, EVC, and LCEVC. And then we'll look at the codecs and the roles they play and handicap when I think they will be adopted. The first reality I want to discuss is the difference between hardware and software codecs. Software codecs play in software at full frame rate without significantly shortening the battery life of the device it's playing on. And you can deploy software codecs immediately because they play in software. Now on PCs, it's best if the codec is supported in browsers, but otherwise you can achieve compatibility by using a specific player like Bitmovin, JW, or Theo player. Mobile devices, even if the codec isn't supported on the mobile OS, you can deploy via apps. Things get a little bit tougher on smart TVs, OTT, and STBs, which may be supported by some apps, but are device dependent. So with PCs and mobile devices, you almost certainly can support a new codec via a player or an app, even if it's not supported in the mobile OS or PC OS. But on smart TV, OTT, and STB, that may not be possible. Now, a hardware codec is too complex for real-time playback or will overconsume battery life on devices. For this reason, you can't deploy hardware codecs until hardware decode is available. And as we'll discuss a couple of times during this presentation, it's typically a two-year cycle after standard finalization or royalty setting before you start to see devices with hardware playback in them. And that just gets you to the first device. It also takes another two to three years before there's a critical mass in a relevant target market to start encoding in that particular codec. So software codecs you can deploy pretty quickly, hardware codecs two years to devices and two to three years to critical mass. And I wanna look at the codec markets that we typically address. And way back when things started in the browser space, which were computers and notebooks, and these devices have a powerful enough general purpose CPU to play a lot of different codecs. And while there are some battery considerations with notebooks, they're nowhere near as important as they are with most mobile devices like, like phones and tablets. So if you're benchmarking the success of a codec, software codec is obviously going to be much easier to launch. If it's got browser support, it's even easier because if, hey, if it plays in Chrome, you can, you can launch it right away. And hardware support will ultimately get there down the road. So H.264 started as a hardware codec, and then it moved to software. But still, on most computers and notebooks today, there is hardware support for H.264 playback just because it's more efficient that way. And the dominant codecs in the browser space today are H.264, VP9, and AV1. The second biggest market is mobile devices, and this is tablets and smartphones. And here we have a less powerful, but still a, a, a pretty powerful general purpose CPU. Now here, battery considerations are critical because nobody wants to deploy a codec that's gonna cut their battery life. So if you look at the codec success factors, OS support is a biggie because that makes it simple to distribute. Browser support, same thing. But hardware support is absolutely critical for a hardware codec to succeed because otherwise you'll run out of battery life. And then once you get hardware support, you need that critical mass that we talked about. So mobile codecs today are H.264, VP9, HEBC, and AV1. And then in the living room is a completely separate market, primarily for premium content. And here you're looking at smart TVs, OTT devices, and set-top boxes. Now, unlike CPUs in computers and mobile devices, these are very application-specific limited power CPUs, which means they can't play hardware codecs in software. You're going to need hardware support to make these work. On the other hand, there are no battery considerations because, hey, you're always going to play your smart TV when it's plugged in. So that's not an issue. But... For a new codec, you need hardware support because of the weak CPU. And once you start to see hardware support in those devices, in smart TVs or STBs or OTT devices, then you need to wait until there's a critical mass before you start encoding to distribute to those devices. Now today, the critical codecs in the 
living room are H.264, HEBC, and VP9. And I just wanted to include other, just to note that there are some markets where whether it's hardware versus software, whether it's supported in the operating system, isn't going to matter. So if you're looking at closed security systems where you've got an encoder at one location and a decoder at another, typically it's going to be a hardware codec, but you don't care if it's supported in Windows or supported in, in the Mac OS because you're going to have an application-specific device on both the encode side and the decode side. Same thing for contribution, same thing for news gathering. CPUs vary for these devices. Typically, some have battery considerations, some don't, most don't. Um, and codec success factor here is typically hardware support because the higher performing codecs typically have hardware. And today, the dominant codecs in this market are H.264 and HEBC. You don't see VP9 playing a lot in these markets. You don't see AV1. Now, the mass markets, when we talk about streaming media, are these three markets. Codecs can succeed here and achieve moderate success, but this is where most people target their streams, and this is where most codec developers hope their codecs succeed. Now let's look at the impact of the Alliance for Open Media and the AV1 codec on the success or lack of success of standard-based codecs. So the Alliance for Open Media was a group formed in 2015 after HEBC Advance. Now Access Advance launched the second HEBC pool and asked for $40 million uh, cap. Actually, when they first launched, there wasn't a cap. So a lot of major companies in the computer space got together and said, hey, we can do this ourselves. We don't need the standard-based codecs. And prominent members included in the desktop and mobile OS market, Apple, Microsoft, and Google. In the device space, Apple, Google, Samsung, and Amazon. In the component space, the chip-level products are Intel, NVIDIA, ARM, Idiom, and others. And then content, was YouTube, Netflix, Amazon, Facebook, and Hulu. And then infrastructure, you know, uh, cloud encoding devices, player support, encoder support were Bitmovin, ATEM, and AWS Elemental. So what does this mean? This means that the Alliance for Open Media members who are pushing the AV1 codec have tremendous control over which codecs are going to be integrated into the operating system. You've got Windows and you've got Mac OS, which are the two prominent desktop operating systems. Ditto on the mobile OS hardware. So you've got Android and iOS. This is owned by Google. This is owned by Apple. And then in browsers, you've got Mozilla, who's a member of the Alliance for Open Media, Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, and Apple Safari. So th these companies here control which codecs are adopted in browsers. They also control which codecs are integrated into the hardware. We talked about why hardware support is important. These companies in the Alliance for Open Media control which codecs will be supported in their devices. And they also dominate content. So you see Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, Prime Video, all the ones we discussed here. Now, the importance of content is if you knew YouTube was going to be supporting 4K and 8K videos with the AV1 codec and only the AV1 codec, and you were building a smart TV for distribution in you know, 2024, you would want to support AV1 because you knew that your customers are going to want to play these videos. So because the Alliance for Open Media members dominate content, they also have a tremendous influence on which codecs are adopted on the player side even among companies who aren't in the Alliance. But there are a lot of integral companies in the Alliance, including Samsung, which sells a lot of smart TVs, Apple with the Apple TV, Chromecast, which is Google's OTT device, and Amazon Fire TV, which is Amazon. So these are obviously critical companies in the content viewing platforms. And then on the infrastructure side, these companies have an influence of which codecs are supported in their encoding farms, players, and other products. The bottom line is that Alliance for Open Media members can slow or block the deployment of standard-based codecs in browsers, which they're already doing with AGBC, in desktop operating systems, in smart TVs, dongles, and STBs, in cloud encoding facilities, and in content encoding and delivery from major content sources. AO Media members can also promote codec support in playback devices by encoding popular content with AV1 and soon AV2. Because Netflix is using AV1, because YouTube is using AV1, because Prime is using AV1, most device developers will want to support those codecs. So this really helps AV1, and this really hurts MPEG codecs if these companies do what they can to slow the development or deployment of MPEG-based codecs. It used to be that an MPEG codec was almost guaranteed to succeed. 
and that includes MPEG-1, MPEG-2, H.264, and even HEVC in broadcast markets. Today, AO Media makes it much tougher for MPEG codecs to succeed. So let's meet the existing codecs, and then we'll meet the new codecs from MPEG that were delivered in the 2020-2021 timeframe. So here's the current codec overview. We'll start with H.264. This is a standard-based codec, so it was formulated by committee. There is one patent pool from MPEG-LA. There are royalties on paid content for subscription and pay-per-view, but they're, they're pretty minimal for large companies. There's no royalties on free internet video. There is royalties on hardware encode, decode, and royalties on software encode, decode. And the maximum annual known royalty is 9.75 million from MPEG-LA. And this today is a software codec because it's so lightweight in terms of encoding and decoding, even though it is supporting, supported by hardware on most playback devices. Now let's look at HEVC. HEVC, like H.264, is a standard-based codec. We went from one patent pool to three patent pools, and that includes MPEG-LA, Access Advance, formerly HEVC Advance, and Velos Media. And Interestingly, MPEG-LA came out soon after the 2013 release of HEBC. Access Advance, or HEBC Advance at the time, came out in 2015, so it was two years later, and Velos Media came out in 2017. So when we talk about a disjointed patent pool approach to HEBC, that's what I'm talking about. Not only did they come out late, they charged much more in terms of royalties. Now, in terms of royalties on paid content, MPEG-LA had said there will be none. Access Advance wants royalties on physical media, and Velos, it's unclear. We don't know what their terms are, and we don't know whether they're going to seek royalties on free internet video or not. They, they state that they're unclear on that in their FAQ. All three of these pools want royalties on hardware encode decode and software encode and decode. And the royalty has jumped for MPEG-LA from 9.75 to 25 million. Access Advance has a $40 million royalty on the encode decode side, and that's per annum, plus an additional 2.5 to 5 million on this type of content, content on physical media. And Velos Media, we just don't know what the terms are because they haven't disclosed. And HEBC is considered a hardware codec, though at this point hardware support is pretty well integrated into all products in the encode, decode, whether it's uh, smart TVs, mobile devices, or even computers. VP9 is from Google, and though Google claims the codec is open source and royalty free, there's a patent pool from a patent pool administrator named Sysvel that's claiming royalties on VP9. Sysvel is not seeking royalties on paid content. They're not seeking royalties on free internet video. They are seeking royalties on consumer devices with hardware encode and decode of VP9. They're not currently seeking royalties on software products like browsers that play back VP9 or encode it. There is no maximum annual known royalty. Each deal is done on a case-by-case -case basis. And VP9 is considered a software codec, though it has good hardware support in a lot of OTT devices and smart TVs, meaning VP9 can play in software on computers, even though it's not supported in hardware. And AV1 is from the Alliance for Open Media. And again, though the Alliance for Open Media claims that AV1 is open source and royalty free, Sysvel has a patent pool that's claiming royalties on AV1. And the terms are the same as what I just discussed. There's no royalties on paid content, no royalties on free internet video. There are royalties on hardware, encode, and decode on consumer devices, but not in software. Deals are done on a company by company basis. And AV1 is considered a software codec. It's being deployed on many platforms now without hardware support. So that takes us to the MPEG Codex 2020. And I want to look at the overview and goals of MPEG in creating three codecs in a two-year period. And then we'll look at VVC, EVC, and LC-EVC, what they offer and why they exist, and how they accomplish the goals that we set up here. So here's the overview. MPEG is the Moving Pictures Experts Group, and it's a standards body that created MPEG-2. And along with the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, it produced H.264 and ABC, H.265 and ATBC, and H.266 and VVC. So the reason these codecs have two names is because one name is for the ITU and one name is for MPEG. 
Now for perspective, there was a 10 year gap between MPEG-2 and H.264 and H.264 and HEBC. And then we saw three new codecs launched within a 12 month period. Now there were three motivations to accomplish these new standards. First was the HEBC royalty disaster, which I defined a few minutes ago. And this is what it looks like. There's three pools here that contains the companies in each pool, MPEG LA, HEBC Advance, now called Access Advance, and VELAS. And beyond those three pools, there's also other companies who have known HEBC IP or patents that they're not in a pool and they haven't disclosed whether or not they will be seeking royalties. So this is a mess and it's really held back the support of HEBC. And, and really this mess is what caused the formation of the Alliance for Open Media. And now that the Alliance for Open Media exists, it's an alluring alternative to MPEG Codex because again, the Alliance for Open Media is saying that it's royalty free. Now we don't know at this point whether it's not, it's going to be royalty free, but this is what the Alliance for Open Media is saying it will be. And the third motivation was encoding complexity was driving up encoding costs. And this is from David Ronka, who's director of video encoding at Facebook and used to be the director of video encoding at Netflix. And his point here in this slide in a uh, LinkedIn post that he produced in back in 2019 was that we're starting to get to really hard to encode codecs here and the benefits that they're delivering are lower and lower. So he felt that the next codec should be lower complexity so that it was easier to deploy on both the encode and decode side. So MPEG needed with the new codecs that they launched a rational royalty policy, technologies to compete with AB1, and a CPU efficient alternative that was less complex than what we saw with HEBC. So the first codec launched by MPEG was Versatile Video Coding VVC. And this is the typical MPEG codec. And the quality is between 30 to 50% more efficient than HEBC. And this is from some of the early VVC presentation documents. Encoding complexity is targeted as 10x HEBC. And here it's achieving about 8.9x HEBC. And decoding complexity is 1.6x as we see here. So this is a lot harder to encode and decode than HEBC, which makes it a hardware codec. And the benefit that we're hoping to see from VBC is around 37%. Now I actually tested Fraunhofer's VBC implementation in December 2020. And I compared it with these codecs here, and you can go read the article here. I tested three clips to produce the encoding time comparisons. And the spec says VBC should be 10x HEBC, and here we're seeing 12x. So here we're seeing x.265 at 10 minutes for on average for the three clips. And VBC, or the Fraunhofer implementation of VBC, was 125 minutes. So it's around 12x on track for the 10x. And it's about 2x the complexity of AB1 on the encode side. So again, these are the three clips. Uh, X.264 produced them in four minutes. X.265 in 10 minutes. The Alliance for Open Media's AV1 codec in 65 minutes. And VVENC, which is Fraunhofer's implementation, implementation of VVC, in around two hours and five minutes. So VVC is about twice the complexity of AV1 on the encode side. In terms of quality, I found that VVC, or at least Fraunhofer's implementation of VVC, was 11% more efficient than AOM ENC, again, the Alliance for Open Media's AB1 codec, about 39% more efficient than X.265, and about 58% more efficient than X.264. So that's encode decode performance. Now let's look at the royalty policy. Around the time that VVC was launched, a new organization came into formation called the Media Coding Industry Forum, or MCIF. And its charter was to make the royalty policy of VVC much more palatable than what we saw with HEBC. And the schema that they put into place was the ability to register subprofiles that can exclude specific tools from recalcitrant vendors. And this is from one of the early presentations from the MCIF. And basically what this means, if, the, if there's a company who's claiming unreasonable amounts of royalties for their tools, for the patents that, that they have contributed to the BBC standard, they can exclude that technology from different profiles, 
which means you don't have to use their technology in your VVC profile. And what we've seen to date is that two patent pools in formation now, Access Advance, again formerly HEBC Advance, and MPEG LA, and these were formed in the late 2020, early 2021 timeframe. Now, it's important to realize that after you form a pool, you've got to pursue due diligence for the included patents to make sure that they contain technology that's essential to, in this case, VVC. And then you've got to get all the patent owners in the pool to agree to pricing discussions. So even though the pools were formed right around the start of 2021, it could easily be another 12 months before the royalty discussions are finalized until we know what the royalty is going to be for VVC. So in summary, VVC offers the ability to exclude technologies based on profiles, and that may speed the licensing process, but it limits our ability to predict how VVC will perform. Because we can't tell at this point what tools will be included in the different profiles. Now, the licensing formation process has started, but we don't know when terms will be available. Wouldn't be surprised me if we didn't hear terms from both patent pools until well into 2022. And though some disagree, VVC is likely a hardware codec in my view, which means that it will take two years after chip development starts before consumer level products appear. And after that two year cycle, there's another two to three years before there's an addressable critical mass for OTT producers to start encoding with VVC to address that market. So how did VVC do accomplishing MPEG's goals? A rational royalty policy may be in place with the MCIF, but we won't know for another 12 months at this point. It's done nothing to compete against AB1 because it is not going to be royalty free, and it does nothing to reduce complexity. As I said at the start of the discussion of BBC, it's the typical MPEG codec, more complex, more efficient. What about essential video coding? Essential video coding offers two profiles. One is royalty free, which is, addresses the AB1 concern. And the main profile is controlled by three companies, which hopefully will lead to a cohesive and quickly forming royalty policy. In terms of performing, the baseline version, this is the royalty free version, is supposed to be 31% more efficient than H.264. And this is what we saw from some of the early EVC document. So again, the anchor or the codec we're comparing this to, the baseline version is H.264. And in this test case, it was 31.4% more efficient. Now the main profile, the one that will be royalty bearing is compared to HEBC. And these tests found the main profile to be 27% more efficient than HEBC, which is a nice performance jump. In terms of complexity, on the encode decode side, the baseline was around 42% harder to encode and 116% harder to decode. So this might be a software codec, probably is going to end up being a hardware codec. And in terms of the main, in these tests, we found that it was 450% more complex on the encode side and 154% more complex on the decode side. So these certainly put you in the hardware codec space, which means that you wouldn't expect to see EVC deployed until there was hardware on the devices you were sending the video to. And here's some additional results from October 2020 with the main profile com compared to HEVC. At 4K, the main profile was 36% more efficient. With 2K, it was 35% more efficient. So what about the royalty side? So to control royalties, we've got the baseline profile that supposedly only uses either technologies that are 20 years old, so the patents have expired, or are royalty-free. Now again, just because companies say it's royalty-free doesn't mean that it is royalty-free. So we'll, we'll have to see what happens to this down the road. In terms of the main profile, it adds a small number of additional tools. And like we saw with VVC, these tools can be isolated so they can be enabled, disabled. If one of the three companies who's offering IP to the EV spec wants to charge too much for their tool, you can simply exclude it in your implementation of the codec and then you don't have to pay that royalty. Then timely publication of licensing terms was encouraged by the primary IP owners, which were Samsung, Huawei, and Qualcomm. And the goal was to publish royalty policies within two years after the first draft international standard, which occurred in June 2020. So we do expect terms, worst case, by June 2022. 
So how did EVC help accomplish MPEG's goals in terms of rational royalty policy? Because there's a limited group of IP participants and a two-year timeline for the announcement of the royalty terms, it should end up being better than HEBC. It helps compete against AV1 because there's a royalty-free baseline profile, or at least what MPEG hopes is a royalty-free baseline profile. And it does reduce complexity on the baseline side, though the main profile is more complex than HEBC. And that takes us to LCEVC, which is the most unusual of the three codecs. So LCEVC is a standardization of the VNOVA Perseus technology. So VNOVA is a company launched, I want to say, 2016 or so, and they've been selling Perseus technology, which they then standardized in the MPEG standards body. And what Perseus does, or what LCEVC does, it has two layers. The first layer is the baseline layer, and that is done with an existing codec like H.264, HTBC, VP9, AV1, could be any existing codec. And then LCEVC uses an enhancement layer above that to provide additional resolution and additional quality. So if this was a 1080p video stream, this base layer in H.264 format might be 640 by 360, and then the enhancement layer would take the 640 by 360 all the way up to 1080p. Now, what's interesting about LCEVC is that the H.264 stream can play on any device that plays H.264. So you can play this combined stream on an older iPad, for example, that won't support LCEVC because it will play the base layer and not the enhancement layer. So there's very good backwards compatibility that you don't see with, with any other codec. On the royalty side, because VNOVA controlled all the IP, they were able to launch terms for the royalty policy in January 2021. So when do we expect LCEVC to be relevant? And let's look at the performance. This is tests that will be published in a report on the Streaming Learning Center. You probably can go there now and download the report. And we tested two full encoding ladders looking at two use cases, e-games, which are computer games, and sports. And we used weighted average results where we looked at the overall encoding ladder using the expected playback statistics for that rung or those rungs in the ladder. And you can read what this means in the report if you download it. And what we found was that overall there was an 18% bandwidth savings using the weighted average computation, 14% of that in e-games, 22% in sports. And with these bandwidth reductions came quality uplifts, so MOS scores, which are mean opinion scores for subjective testing, improved from 5 to 5.6 from X.264 to LCEBC with X.264 as a base layer. VMAF, and this is the eGames example, improved from 73.6 to 76.3. Sports, we saw an increase from 6.4 to 6.8 in the mean opinion scores, and VMAF was 91.6 to 93.3. So we saw a real-world reduction of bandwidth between 14 and 22% with quality uplifts throughout in the encoding ladder. So that's pretty impressive. In terms of encoding requirements, again, these were performed with full encoding ladders. This is the eGames example, which was the more challenging of the two. And we encoded both ladders on the same AWS instance. You see it here. This is the average CPU utilization for X.264. This is for LCEVC with X.264 as a base layer. Average CPU here was 81.5, here it was 73.7. So what we found was that LCEVC with X.264 as a base layer consumed about 8% less CPU than X.264 despite encoding 30% more pixels and producing higher quality. And on the decode side, you know, here we see H.264 decode of a 2 megabit per second file. Here we see LCEVC decode of a 2 megabit per second file. And this is at H.264 decode with hardware support on the device it's being pay played back on. This is LCEVC decode with hardware support for the base layer, but not for the enhancement layer. Here we're me measuring voltage, here we're measuring power. We see that the voltage requirement for H.264 decode was slightly higher than LCEVC, and the power requirements were about the same. So basically, LCEVC decodes more efficiently, even though it lacks hardware decoding for the enhanced layer platform. 
LCEVC summary, it's currently shipping as licensed by Vinova. It's the only software codec of the three new MPEG codecs. The royalty structure was announced in early 2021, which means developers know what it's going to cost them to use the technology and then they can make a decision whether to support it or not. And it's a consistent positive performer in both subjective trials and using VMAF, the objective quality metric from Netflix. It's in trial use with Al Jazeera and others but we're still waiting a high profile top of the pyramid deployment. So, you know, I would love to see a company like Facebook or Netflix or, or, or Amazon Prime start to deploy LCEVC because that tells me that uh, everything that I found in my tests were confirmed by other eyes and other testers. And this article by Tommy Flanagan, I think says it best, it celebrates final draft standard. Now it has to convince people that it works. And this is where we are today in terms of LCEVC deployment. So how does LCEVC accomplish MPEG goals in terms of rational royalty policy? Because there's a single IP owner, they were already able to announce a royalty policy in January, 2021. It's the only known policy of the three. In terms of competing against AV1, the royalty should be by far the lowest of the three. And in terms of reducing complexity, it's the only uh, one of the three codecs that's actually easier to encode and decode than H.264. So it's the only software codec that can be deployed and is in fact being deployed today. Now let's look at the factors contributing to the timing of codec adoption. Now if you're a hardware codec, it really helps to have a known royalty policy because many chip producers won't start to deploy until the royalty is known. And that's the direct result of what happened with HEBC. A lot of companies started developing HEBC in their products before they knew that the royalties were gonna be 65 million a year plus as compared to 10 million plus for H.264. And once the chip developers start integrating that codec into their products, it's one year from the start of the development until you get chips. It's another year to develop consumer devices and hardware encoders based on those chips. And then there's another two to three years in the living room before there's a critical mass that's worth encoding in that format to deliver to those devices. For software codecs like AV1 and LCEVC, the fastest way to gain deployment is integration in browsers. That worked very well for AV1, but it's unlikely to happen with LCEVC because it's an MPEG-based codec. So what Vnova has done is develop workarounds by gaining playback support in players like TheoPlayer and others that producers can simply use as the player that they integrate into their playback stack. So let's look at codec deployment of hardware codecs in the best case scenario. And by best case, I mean that chip developers start developing support for the new codec the day it's announced. They don't wait until royalty policies are known. So the spec is finalized on January 2021, and that means chips are available around January 2022. Consumer products start development. The first consumer product with this chip is available around January 2023. So it's, that's the two-year cycle we talked about. But then it takes a long time to achieve critical mass because you're not going to start encoding for a single device out there, you're gonna wait until there's a bunch of products out there. So basically we're seeing a four year cycle best case if the chip developers don't wait until a known royalty policy to support to start supporting the new technology. In terms of perspective, HEBC is already in full production because all the chips are available and actually shipping in a lot of consumer level products as well as encoder and decoder products. So. We've, we've already passed this four-year cycle, but VVC and EVC will have some chip vendors who will start to integrate right away. So we should expect to see some consumer devices. They started around June 2020, so we should expect to see some critical mass of products perhaps in the June 2024 timeframe. What about the worst case? And by worst case, I mean chip developers won't start developing to support the new codec until the royalty policy is known. So here the spec is finalized on say January, 2021. The patent policy is announced say a year later, which as we saw EVC committed to a two year cycle. So it could even be longer than a single year. Chip developers start producing then, we see chips available and then the same schedule we saw on the previous slide where consumer products are available here, critical mass here, but it's a five to six year cycle depending upon how long it takes for the patent policy to be announced. And I think this is a probable use case for many chip vendors, especially those in the Alliance for Open Media, which means that we shouldn't expect a critical mass of products playing VVC or EVC until 
maybe even the 2026 or 2027 timeframe. What does this look like for a software codec like LCEVC? Spec finalized January 2021, patent policy announced around the same time. Software strategy is defined, and that's what I meant when I talked about using players like TheoPlayer to gain compatibility in the browser. Sales outreach starts immediately, and it actually started way back here because they've been selling the technology all along. They reach an agreement with a high profile deployment, and this could really trigger the widespread adoption of LCEVC. It can be immediately relevant because it's a software-based codec, unlike the hardware codecs that we saw a moment ago. So let's take these assumptions to actual codecs like HEBC. The royalty policy is now mostly known. Silicon is available. It's available for playback in devices. The market share is worth chasing now. But it will probably never be relevant in the browser because of all the Alliance for Open Media members control the browsers. It's available for live contribution now, live transcoding on hardware side now, live transcoding software, it's available now. I think hardware is more efficient, but you can do it in software. It's available for low latency, and it's available for HDR. So basically, HEVC is full bore, go ahead. VP9, kind of the same deal. The royalty is a bit unknown at this point, but I think that should coalesce in the next 6 to 12 months. Silicon is available, but because it's a software codec, it's not essential. There are many devices that support VP9, primarily almost everyone that isn't Apple, and obviously Google supports it. The market share is worth chasing now because of the Android support and because of browser support. It's available in the browser now. On the live side, there are a few options to produce live encodes with VP9, either encode you know, for contribution or transcode, but you can find one or two if you're determined to make VP9 work in that space. Live transcoding, as I mentioned, VP9 is very inefficient on the software transcoding side, so I wouldn't see that being widely usable until this time frame. Low latency is available now in WebRTC. It's available in HLG for HDR, but HEBC enjoys many more supports in standards than VP9 does. AV1, Again, same royalty issue as we saw with VP9 because of the sysfile patent pool. It's available in some silicon. We, for, we saw the first silicon appearing maybe 12 months ago, and we're starting to see some hardware products based upon that silicon. The market share is worth chasing now because of browser and software decode on devices. Because it's supported in Chrome and Mozilla, a lot of publishers are able to encode to AV1 because they can send those streams to a lot of different devices. It's available on most browsers today. I would expect live contribution in June 2021. A company called NetInt has announced live contribution and transcoding hardware. And like VP9, AV1 is very inefficient on the transcode side, so I wouldn't see it being usable until this time frame. Low latency is available today from Cisco and WebRTC. HDR, AV1 has the color depth, but it's just not supported in standards so far. What about VVC? I think I'm being optimistic by saying that there's going to be a known royalty policy by June of this year. But once we have that policy, I think it starts to get interesting for some hardware developers. That gives the silicon in June 2022, devices in June 2023, and market share worth chasing about two years after that. And this is when VBC should get interesting for OTT publishers. I don't think VBC will ever be supported in browsers owned by Alliance for Open Media members, so I don't think it's ever going to be used for computer or mobile playback in the browser. I think live contribution will be available you know, pretty much one year after silicon is available. Live transcoding hardware, a little bit after that. Live transcoding software, it's very, very complex. I wouldn't expect to see that until well in the 2026, 2027 timeframe. In terms of the latency, that should be available when you have live transcoding hardware. HDR should be available by the time these devices are available. Here's EVC. We should expect a known royalty by June 2022, maybe sooner. That's when EVC gets interesting for hardware developers. Silicon comes 12 months later, devices 12 months after that, market share worth chasing two to three years after that. And this is where EVC gets interesting for publishers. Not sure we'll ever see EVC in the browser for reasons stated. Live contribution will be sometime after the availability of silicon. Live transcoding hardware, same deal. Live transcoding software, again, it's a very complex codec, so it's going to be long down the line. Low latency and HDR here, but it doesn't make sense to even think about this until you have a critical mass. What about LCEVC? 
the royalty became known in January 2021, which should lead to silicon on a mass scale, primarily for playback on devices in June 2022, and then device support itself in June 2023. But of course, device support is not going to be necessary because LCEVC is a software-based codec. It's a little bit more efficient to do it in hardware, but we can we will start to see deployments today because there are deployments today going on. The market share is worth chasing now because it's available in the browser via a player. Now, VNova has already developed chips that give it live contribution capabilities in hardware today. So that's a, another product line that they have shipping today. They should be able to convert these chips, which are primarily encoders, to live transcoding hardware by June 2021. But it really isn't going to be necessary to have hardware because live transcoding of full encoding ladders is available very efficiently today in software, as we saw during the LC EVC portion of the presentation. Low latency should be available in June 2021, with HDR support predicted to be available around January 2022. Now, those are my predictions. I found an interesting article in Streaming Media, and this was produced by a gentleman named Jan de Kock, who used to work for Netflix and now works for Cinemedia. And you can find the article here. And this is in the OTT space, and he's looking at what codecs are used now and what he predicts will be used in three to five years. Three to five years is, is, a, is a big deal. The difference between three and five is a big deal, I should say. But he's saying today AV1 is a, a small portion here, VP9 is bigger, HEVC primarily to living room TVs and OTT players is used here, but the vast majority of video is delivered via H.264 and even some older formats. In three to five years, he's predicting that VVC will be a small portion of the overall codec usage, AV1 much bigger, VP9 reduced, HEVC looking to be about the same, and H.264 and AVC still close to 50% of the encodes that are going to be in deployment at that time. Now, if he said three years, I would say VVC shouldn't be this big a portion, although it might be used for contribution. It's not going to be in enough devices to be worth chasing for most uh, OTT producers. And certainly the, the developers that are included in the Alliance for Open Media are not going to be chasing early VVC deployments. So I would see AV1 having more share here. I would see VP9 being much more squeezed because AV1 is going to be playing everywhere VP9 plays and is more efficient. Can't argue with HEVC. I, I think that's still going to be popular three to five years from now because of the penetration in living rooms and can't argue with this either. So this is OTT space and this is broadcast space, which is much more standard based. And he's saying in 2021, HEBC is a substantial market share with very little to AV1. H.264 and ABC is the bulk, but there's still a lot of MPEG-2 present. And three to five years from now, he's predicting VVC, perhaps encroaching on AV1 space, HEBC, H.264, and MPEG-2. And he's basically predicting that standard-based codecs will win the broadcast market. And I can't argue with that either. I just don't th think that VVC will be available in substantial quantities in the three-year time frame. I think five years is much more realistic.